Good morning. First off, this morning I'd like to have a moment of prayer for the people of Japan and to let them know that we are here with and for you. So let us pray. Father in heaven, you are the absolute sovereign, sovereign over the shaking of the earth, the rising of the sea, and the raging of the waves. We tremble at your power and bow before your unsearchable judgments. In inscrutable ways, we cover our faces and kiss our omnipotent hand. We fail. We fall helpless to the floor in prayer and feel how fragile the, the very ground is beneath our knees. O oh God, we humble ourselves under your holy majesty and repent in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we too, we too could be swept away. We are not more deserving of firm ground than our fellow men in Japan. We too are flesh. We have bodies and homes and cars and families and precious places. We know that if we were treated according to our sins, who could stand? All of it would be gone in a moment, so in this dark hour we turn against our sins, not against you. And we cry for mercy for Japan, mercy, Father, not for what they or we deserve, but mercy. Have you not encouraged us in this? Have we not heard a hundred times in your word the riches of your kindness, forbearance, and patience? Do you not... A thousand times withhold your judgments, leading your rebellious word toward repentance? Yes, Lord, for your ways are not our ways, and your thoughts are not our thoughts. Grant, O God, that the wicked will forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Grant us, your sinful creatures, to return to you, that you may have compassion, for surely you will be abundantly pardoned, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, will be saved. My ever heartbreaking loss, millions upon millions of losses, be healed by the wounded hands of the rising Christ. You are not unacquainted with your creature's pain. You did not spare your own Son, but gave him up for all of us. In Jesus you tasted loss. In Jesus you shared the overwhelming flood of our sorrows. And suffering in Jesus, you are a sympathetic priest in the midst of our pain. Deal tenderly now, Father, with this fragile people. Woo them, win them, save them. And may the floods they so much dread make blessings break upon their head. Oh, let them not judge you with feeble sense, but trust you for your grace. And so behind this providence, soon find a smiling face. In Jesus' merciful name, amen. Which brings us to our sermon, the Book of Life. I think after the events in Japan, we should study the Book of Life. In Philipp we're going to study Philippian, Phil Philippians 4, verse 1 through 7. The subject of this study is set forth in verse 2 and 3. I implore Ero and I implore Senich to be of the same mind in the Lord, and urge you also, true companion, Help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. We know the names of some of the members of this noted first century congregation. Two Christian women are mentioned by name, Iodon and Sintench. And one man's name is listed cement. It is generally believed that he became one of the elders of the church in Rome, who lived in the second century and became very prominent in the church. Paul's first message to the church was stop idle and sinners from quarreling and opposing one another, whether it was over church doctrine or something else, we don't know. Their feuding, wrangling, and squabbing was disturbing. The church and Paul wanted it to stop. Conflicts are common in the church and often result in divisions. In a cartoon, this notice was placed on a church bulletin board. 213 days without a split. Listen to the text again as recorded in the Amplified New Testament. Therefore, my brethren, whom I love and yearn to see my delight and crown, wrath of victory, thus stand firm in the Lord, my beloved, I entreat and advise you, and I entreat and advise Sinich to agree to work in harmony in the Lord, and I exhort you to my genuine yoke, fellow help these two women to keep on cooperating. For they have toiled along with me in the spreading of the good news, as have Cement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the Book of Life. 
Here are the two of Paul's skilled church workers, and they are in conflict with one another. Arguing and disputing with one another, Paul loved these two women for their work, for their work's sake. These two women here addressed doubtless were influential members of this congregation. These good women helped the apostle in Christian teaching. Paul said, these women labored with me in the gospel. They were skilled teachers and good students of the word. As women were not allowed to be preachers in the church, as taught in 1 Timothy 2.12, it is evident that their service was of more private kind, either in instructing the young or more probably in helping bring women to Christ and instructing female converts. Whatever their disagreements may have been, their differences were not of a kind calculated to mar their influence and disturb the faith of others in the church. There is much disputing among women as to the proper role of women in the church. This is quite a serious conflict, and the conflict is far from being resolved. Many other conflicts have beset the New Testament church, and many of them had been resolved. The Lord's church has never been very good at conflict resolution. Paul concluded his thoughts on this troublesome matter by saying, Finally, brethren, whether things are true, whether things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Philippians 4, 8 and 9. If the church had followed these instructions, there would have been more peace and less conflict in the Lord's church for the past 2,000 years. Secondly, Paul made another very important statement about Udua and Sintens. After pleading with them to stop quarreling and urging properly, Ephemidius himself, himself, the bearer of the Philippine letter, to help these two women whose names were in the Book of Life, God had recorded the names of Udua and Sintens in the Book of Life. The fact alone was sufficient reason to resolve their differences and stop fighting and quarreling. The fact that Cement's name and the names of all other co-workers of Paul were in the Book of Life is is necessarily implied that the names of all the members of the Church of Philippi were also in the Book of Life. The phrase Book of Life mentioned several times in the Bible. It is first mentioned in Deuteronomy 32.32. Israel had sinned by worshipping a golden calf at the base of Mount Sinai. And God threatened to destroy the nation and start all over with Moses. But Moses answered, but Moses said to God, If you will not forgive Israel for what they did, then blot me out of your book. <clears throat> but God answered Moses in this way, Whoever sins against me, him I will blot out of my book. Malachi 3.16 says, Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord. The book of life is God's book of remembrance. Jesus said to one of one churches in Asia Minor, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name from the book of life. Revelation 3 5. We learn here that the name of every Christian is written in the book of life, but it is not written in indelible ink. It can be erased, blotted out, and eliminated. Language could not be more definitely indicate the possibility that Christians can be lost. Any other view renders the language not only misleading, but actually false. Unless Christians are in danger of being overcome by evil in the world, the statement of Jesus is that Christians' eternal salvation depends on their overcoming evil. If it were not possible for Christians to overcome, there would be no point in expressing this condition. The unquestionable means that such will be lost in spite of this clear warning. Most of the Christendom is wedded to the belief that under no circumstances can a Christian lose his salvation. This is almost universal doctrine in Christendom, that once you are saved, you will always be saved. The doctrine once saved, always saved is a direct contradiction of God's word. The book of life mentioned again in Revelation 20.12 As I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works, by the things that were written in the books. 
There are at least three books mentioned in this passage. One is said to be the Book of Life, and the others are simply called the books, plural. Some commentators interpret the books to mean God's Book of Remembrance of records that he kept of men's conducts or actions. And the Book of Life is a record of the names of the righteous. Since according to John 12:48, all people who have lived on the earth for the names of the righteous who have lived on the earth for the past 2,000 years will be judged by the words of Jesus. It seems probable that one of these books represents the Bible, which contains the laws by which mankind shall be judged. Some will be judged by patriarchal law, some by Jewish law, and some by Christian law. It would also be reasonable to conclude that one of the books of record record the conduct, actions, and deeds of people. For the Bible states, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the thing, things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. In addition to the books, another book was opened, which is the Book of Life. In the same chapter, the contents of the Book of Life are clearly revealed in Revelation 20.15. And if any was not found written in the Book of Life, he was cast into the lake of fire, 2 Peter 3.10-12. The ultimate purpose of every human being is to get his name in the book of life and keep that, keep it in that book by living a well-pleasing life to God. I have covered most of the references to the book of life in the Bible. I think we are now prepared to answer the question, what is the book of life? Paul said that he didn't sentence his names were in this book and he was concerned about them. The first thing of interest I would like to say about the Book of Life is that it is called a book. The Hebrew word is sefer, the Greek word is bibelos, and the English word is book. The Book of Life, the Hebrew word, is more comprehensive than our English word book. The Book of Life in, in the Bible is a book of records, a list of names from the time of Adam and Eve to our present time in 2011 AD. God is the author of this book and it is the greatest book ever written. It is a list of people who have found such favor with God, he has selected them at their resurrection from the dead to live forever in heaven, among the angels of heaven, in a, word, in a world of joy and happiness that defies our dreams and imaginations. To the honor of Jesus Christ, this book is also called the Lamb's Book of Life. Every name in that book was cleansed made holy and acceptable to Jehovah by the blood of Christ, who tasted death before every man. Before he died on the cross, the cleansing blood of Christ flowed back through all centuries to Adam and Eve and cleansed everybody it touched. God used his blood to forgive, his, forgive sin before it was shed in the, in the patriarchal age and the Jewish age. There is no name in this book that was not cleansed by the blood of Christ. It is also the Lamb's Book of Life, that the first thing I want to say about this book it is the registry of all people who will go to heaven. We may conclude that the book of life contains the list of all people who conduct, whose conduct has caused their names to be written in this book and whose continued godly life has prevented their names from being blotted out and removed from this book. Now the question that comes to all of us is how many books would it take to write down all the deeds of mankind, both good and bad, for thousands and thousands of years? How could paper last that long? The second thing we want to say about the Book of Life is that it is not a literal book. It is a figurative title originating from the ancient custom of keeping genealogy records and other records. The genealogy of Christ from Adam is carefully recorded in Scripture. It is a universal practice for institutions that consist of individual membership to keep a record of its names in the book. Churches keep a list of members. This fact is the basis for the figurative idea of a book of life which the Lord keeps a list of his people. But God needs no books to help him remember. He has a perfect memory. God's infinite memory will enable him to reward properly both bad and good just as if it is written had been kept. God never forgets his knowledge of men's acts is just an, it's just an accurate as perfect writing in a book or a computer. The reference to a book is our benefit and comfort. 
not for God. It convinces us that God keeps good records and that he will forget no one. Finally, in closing, how do we get our names in the book of life? It is clearly revealed in the text that we have been meditating on. Listen to it again. Help those women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with my other fellow workers whose names are in the book of life, who were Edura, Sinich, Clement, and others who were in the book of life. Who were all these people? Of whom is it said that their names were in the book of life? They were all members of the church that Jesus built in Philippi. Philippians 1.1 1, 1, tells us who they were. To all the saints in Christ, Jesus, are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Philippi and the people in our text said to be in the book of life. All these people said to be in the book of life were members of the church in Philippi. The Bible clearly teaches that all people's names are added to the book of life when Christ adds them to his church. God sent a preacher to the prosecutor, to the persecutor Paul after he had been brought repentance. And Elias said to Paul, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on your name of the Lord. When a person meets the requirements, faith, repentance, and baptism, they become a member of, church, of Christ's church. And his name is automatically added to the book of life, as with Elias, Sintesh, and Clement, who became members of the Lord's church in Philippi. No one is in the book of life who is not in the Lord's church. And if our part benediction today, Pastor Jessica. Senior Pastor's losing his mind today. <clears throat> well, before I say my benediction, this is out of my mind, so if anybody is offended, I'm sorry. But, <clears throat> in my mind, the Book of Life is like God's A-list to his own nightclub or his own VIP lounge in heaven, you know. If you're not on the list, you don't get in. That's how I see it. Can you imagine St. Peter Center going, no, no, you're not on it, I'm sorry, bye. But that's how I'm thinking it. And I'm sorry. <clears throat> don't be on the outside looking in. Get yourself into a Bible-based church and get your name in that book of life. <clears throat> don't, let, don't let your name be blotted out. Don't let it be crossed out. Or crossed off, anyways. Keep faith, keep faith in God and His Word. And dear, and please, people, don't be, up in, don't be up in heaven near the pearly gates and have St. Peter sit there and go, No, I'm sorry, you're not on the list. You can't get in. You know, try and try really hard and help someone. You know, do some good deeds. Get yourself in this book. Exactly. For everyone in Albany, please tune please tune into Fox twenty three. As our church member just said, please tune in to Fox 23 at 10.30, and please watch the uh, stories from the streets, please. Thank you. <clears throat>